Okay, we were kind of in the middle of uh, dealing with uh, electron plasma oscillations. So let's go back and do this. Reminder, this is part of Chen. So what we're trying to do is derive uh, formulas and understand electron plasma oscillations. And they're sort of the most fundamental, simplest, you know, uh, easiest uh, oscillation or perturbation or something to understand in a plasma. And you remember our uh, basic uh, um, way we got to our equation was that first we, as usual, made a few assumptions. And uh, those were basically that uh, there's no magnetic field. Um, secondly, well, I'm keeping the finite temperature now, so I'm saying my second approximation is ions are a uh, uniform plus charge uh, background. So we're not going to worry about ion dynamics. We're just going to worry about electron dynamics. A third assumption was that we had an infinite homogeneous plasma. So we didn't want to worry about gradients in anything. And then finally, uh, we assumed that we were only considered concerned with motion in one direction, namely the so-called x direction. So uh, let's say electrons uh, move only in the x direction. Now, then our strategy was that we used, uh, we used fluid equations for electrons. And that was basically the density conservation equation and the momentum conservation equation. Then we went on beyond that, and we found that we had an equation we couldn't really deal with because it was complicated, nonlinear, et cetera. So our next step was we uh, linearized the equation. Or the equations, I should say. And then we combined the equations, namely the density momentum conservation equation uh, plus uh, Gauss's law because we were dealing with electrostatics because there's no magnetic field. So we combined the equations, and what we finally ended up with then uh, was a rather simple equation, which is just the elect simplest electron plasma oscillation equation, namely the second time derivative of the density perturbation by linearization, we meant we were in you know some homogeneous equilibrium with plus some little oscillations or wiggles on top of it. And so this is an equation only for the wiggle on top of it. And it was the second derivative of the density with respect to time squared plus, and then uh, we had a, a quantity n sub e naught e squared divided by m e uh, epsilon naught. Uh, times the density perturbation, and then minus um, gamma Te over Me times uh, d squared n tilde by dx squared. And this was all uh, equal to zero. So this is rather obviously then, uh, if I leave off that last term, uh, just going to be an equation which is a harmonic oscillator equation with, uh, as we found in Bittencourt uh, problem 1.3, which people did, uh, this is the electron plasma frequency uh, squared. So this is just a, a reminder of where we had um, gotten to last time. What we now want to talk about then is uh, first, uh, you know, what, what is this plasma frequency and what kind of an oscillation is this? Um, and uh, that sort of question. So first, uh, let's note uh, that if, just 
to go back to our equation here, if we take uh, TE goes to zero, which really means physically, it means neglect uh, electron thermal motions. Then what happens is that our equation just becomes d squared n tilde by dt squared plus omega p e squared times n tilde is equal to zero. And that obviously has a solution n tilde goes like e to, again, we use a, a minus e to the minus i omega t, but the particular frequency is the omega p e. And I could really do plus or minus at that point, so I guess I'll do plus or minus there. Now, first, what kind of frequency is this? High, low, something like that. Well, the electron plasma frequency is, well, I guess we'll take this up here, um, is the square root of n naught e. That's the equilibrium electron density, but pragmatically it's also in our plasma, the one we've been taking, the equilibrium ion density as well, n naught e, uh, e squared over m sub e epsilon naught. And, uh, well, we'd like to have this in some units that we kind of uh, perceive to be of interest. So what we'll do is we'll um, take into account that we'd have the density would be measured in units of uh, per meter cubed, good MKS units. The charge of the electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th quantity squared, because we've got the electron charge squared. The electron mass in MKS units is 9.31 times 10 to the minus uh, 31 kilograms. And then epsilon naught, uh, the electric constant of free space, is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th. So if you work all that out, what you find is it's approximately equal to 56 times the square root of n sub e in units of meter per meter cubed. Now, uh, I wrote out this form, although Chen dwells more upon the other one, because notice that the units of this, it's an e to the i omega t, and the omega there is then not the frequency the frequency, the electron plasma frequency in the sense of cycles per second, okay, FPE is going to be omega PE over 2 pi. Uh, and this, it turns out, is then about uh, 9 times the square root of n sub e meters to the minus 3. And so the first one is the radian frequency, so radians per second. And the second one, is uh, hertz or cycles per second or however you want to do it. It's the full um, sinusoidal cycle. So these are then uh, what we talk about. And often in plasma physics, we will use the omega PE. But then, of course, if you go and you ask a person, you say, well, I got an oscillator at some frequency, they'll say, what, how many hertz is that or, you know, gigacycles or something like that. How big is this in some typical units or typical plasma? Well, our typical plasma that we've been taking is like some of the ones, laboratory plasmas here on campus. Uh, the only pla plasma parameter we need is the electron density, and those have densities of, let's say, about 10 to the 19th per meter cubed. Um, so if you take the square root uh, of that, what you find is that you get omega PE of the order of 1.8 times 10 to the 11th radians per second. And this implies an FPE, again the um, cycles per second, of t about 28 gigahertz. So this is, uh, you know, microwave short wavelength microwaves, actually, frequencies. And uh, one thing that, that you might ask is, this is, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is basically the sort of rate at which a plasma just sits there and jiggles up and down in charge all the time, okay? 
And how long a time is that? Well, the typical time um, in a plasma then would be called the plasma period, okay, which would be, oh, you know, depending upon whether you want to take two, uh, you could take that the plasma period would be 1 over omega PE or 1 over FPE. You could take your choice. I've just done it in radians here. And it turns out that's about uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Five picoseconds. So usually we're interested in a little bit longer time scale than this plasma period, okay? But the idea is that this is the most fundamental oscillation that's going on in a plasma. And what kind of an oscillation is it? So plasma oscillations. Well, as Chen talks about, you can, in the representation that we've been doing, you can think of a number of springs and all being independent. And uh, so this is a spatial di distance uh, direction x. And maybe this one's, let's say, coiled up a little bit. And this one's really coiled up. And, and then this one's strung out again. And then this one's maybe coiled up. And they're, they're sort of bouncing back and forth. But the idea is that at any one position in the plasma, uh, the charge density is just like an independent oscillator at any, at any given position in the plasma oscillating up and down. And how fast is it oscillating up and down? At the plasma frequency, you know, 28 gigahertz in the laboratory plasma we're talking about. Now, when we have an equation of the form d squared n uh, dt squared plus omega p e squared n tilde, that sort of means that there's no connection between different spatial positions. It's just sitting there and oscillating up and down all by itself at any one position, independent of all the other positions. However, if I go in a minute here and put in the thermal effects, minus Te over Me, d squared n tilde by dx squared, that will couple at a propagation speed having to do with the electron thermal speed, gamma, uh, that will couple okay, different x regions. So for Te does not equal zero, you'll get some coupling of the modes uh, from one position to another. So um, what these plasma, uh, oh, another couple of little tidbits, so to speak, about the plasma oscillations is, you remember a long time ago we talked about, sort of at first, Debye shielding. Debye shielding was I stick a charged particle in the plasma and the potential, it, is a Coulomb 1 over R potential until about the Debye length, and then it's self-shielded outside of that. So the comment is that, uh, well, let's ask, how, how long does it take for a typical particle to traverse one Debye length? So how long in time does it take for a typical particle, which is a thermal particle, a thermal particle, thermal electron, let's say. That means V is approximately equal to our V thermal E is approximately equal to, or is defined as, root 2 Te over Me uh, to cross a distance delta x of order the electron Debye length. Well, what you find is that that uh, delta t for doing that would be equal to then the distance I have to go divided by the electron thermal velocity. Okay? And how long does that take? Or, or what are those quantities? Well, we have to remember what the Debye length formula was. And um, so... So it's, ah, I goofed. I put in a TE for once. Anyway, so that's uh, epsilon. No, sorry. let's uh, write it out and then I'll get it right. So 1 over the Debye length squared was N sub E E squared over epsilon naught uh, T. 
And so if we stick it upstairs, we're going to get epsilon naught Te, or, yeah, um, and then divided by n sub e, e squared. But then we're going to need a big square root here. Ignore all my goofers here. And then for the electron thermal velocity, we have 2 times the electron temperature over the electron mass. And now the electron temperature cancels out. And what we're left with then is 1 over root 2. Uh, and that root 2 only comes in, by the way, because I took my V thermal and defined it with a root 2 Te. Okay? If I didn't have that, I wouldn't have that, but anyway. And then times the square root of uh, epsilon naught Me over N sub E, e squared. But that's actually just 1 over our plasma frequency. So this is just 1 over root 2 times the electron plasma frequency. So what it's telling us is that then electrons are traversing average typical thermal electrons, are traversing a Debye length distance in a plasma period, plus or minus this root 2 that we won't worry about. So this connects up that in fact, and, and sort of that in fact, uh, well, there's various ways of writing this, but let's just say that the electron Debye length is then equal to um, V thermal E divided by square root of 2 over omega PE. So it gives you a, a feeling that you know all three of these processes are related. The Debye shielding taking place on the Debye length scale, the plasma frequency being the, the rate at which I could, typical electrons can traverse a Debye length distance uh, at their thermal speed. And also, by the way, this is kind of a, a good relationship to know uh, when you're trying to evaluate these things. Okay. So that's uh, sort of the story on plasma oscillations by itself. Oh, and they're longitudinal oscillations, or what one means by that is they're electrostatic, uh, longitudinal. They're not electromagnetic, so there's no pointing vector associated with them. There's no B tilde associated with them. Um, they're just fluctuations in charge density, fluctuations in local charge density, fluctuations in local electric field, local potential. That's, that's really all they are. Okay, now for what we've just been talking about on this uh, electron plasma oscillation equation, I'm feeling that it could look a little better. Try focus, sorry. I'm not sure that helped, but anyway. <laughs> Okay, the comment I want to make, though, is that what we've uh, been dealing with is we neglected the, uh, dis actually what's going to be called in a moment, a dispersion term or a thermal um, term. So let's call this a thermal dispersion effect. And now what we want to do is uh, put that back in. Um, so how are we going to analyze this equation when we do that? Well, it's at this point that we go back and posit or just say we think we're going to have an, a mode that's going to have e to the i kx minus i omega t. And we'll just substitute that in. This will give us omega squared, omega p squared, and this will give us a k squared. So let's uh, go through some of that. So what we do... Um, is uh, presume, and what you actually have to do is take Fourier Laplace transforms and do this upright, but anyway, presume that we'll get an n tilde of the oscillatory type, hence what we mean um, by that is that it's going like e to the i kx minus i omega t. And if, then if we are to take uh, and maybe I'll put my little n hat in here. That'll help me a little bit. 
Um, so if this is the case, then wherever I see partial with respect to t of n tilde, what I will get is minus i omega n hat e to the i kx minus i omega t. But this is what I started with, n tilde, so we can just write it as minus i omega n tilde. Similarly, uh, a second derivative, d squared n tilde by dt squared, is just you know partial with respect to t of partial n tilde with respect to t. Uh, and so this is partial with respect to t of minus i omega times n tilde. Partial with respect to t doesn't operate on the frequency. Frequency is constant. It's a um, Fourier transform variable, actually, or we're looking for certain oscillation at a certain frequency. So partial operates only on the n. So this just gives me minus i omega times minus i omega times n tilde. And all in all, that then gives me minus omega squared n tilde. Um, similarly, if I take uh, dn tilde by dx, okay, this is going to be i k n tilde. Just do the same sort of stuff, but when we have e to the i k x, you just get you know i k and then n tilde n n hat e to the i k x minus i omega t, and d squared n tilde uh, by d x squared is equal to minus or is equal to i k i k times n tilde is equal to minus k squared n tilde. So if we um, substitute in then this ansatz that our particular n tilde is in fact this of, of this oscillatory waveform e to the i k x minus i omega t, then we convert this equation into uh, a very simple dispersion relation is what it's going to be. But what we do is, okay, we, we stick in the d squared t by d d squared n by dt squared becomes, you remember, minus omega squared n tilde. This term was plus omega pe squared times n tilde. And this term we'll write as minus uh, gamma uh, te over me. And then it'll be minus k squared, d squared by dx squared, just minus k squared times n tilde is equal to zero. And now it's at this point that it's uh, convenient um, to say that uh, I'm considering a 1D plasma. And then I can use my standard uh, law for, uh, so -called, uh, three, uh, for, for such that gamma is equal to 2 plus the number of degrees of freedom over the number of degrees of freedom. And 2 plus 1 over 1 is then 3. And so that's what we'll use. And also we'll use the fact that Te over Me uh, is equal to V thermal electron squared over 2. Uh, the over 2 because I chose to make my electron thermal velocity the square root of 2 times Te over Me. Uh, this is a matter of convention. Some people use 2s in various places and some people don't. So what all of this means down here that I've been fiddling with then is that this quantity will then become three halves uh, V thermal electron squared. So when we uh, put all of that together, then our equation becomes minus omega squared. That's from that term, plus omega pe squared. They're all going to be times n tilde, and then a minus minus um, plus um, three halves k squared v thermal electron squared, all times n tilde is equal to zero. So now the consistency condition for being able to have a wave of the form e to the i k dot x minus i omega t is then that 
I'm going to have some n tilde that's not zero, so the rest of this had better be equal to zero. And so the consistency, or what is called dispersion relation, so this leads to the dispersion relation, for e to the i kx minus i omega t waves in the density uh, perturbation of, and now if we set that equal to zero, obviously I should write it as omega squared is equal to omega pe squared. That's what we had before, but now with the thermal correction, we have three halves k squared v thermal electron squared. Uh, and, and again, this is our thermal motion correction to ordinary um, electron plasma oscillations. Okay, now, uh, by the way, we'll come back to deriving this in, in a little bit different way in a moment. And so, but let me just say, this is often known as, and I'll try to remember to mention it again, as the so-called Bohm-Gross dispersion relation. And it's a dispersion relation for, or thought of, as that the frequency of oscillations in this plasma of a given density, so that determines the plasma frequency, and a given temperature, so that that determines the uh, thermal velocity, but for any particular K, uh, is given by this relationship here. And so the fact that omega depends upon k um, will indicate that there's dispersion in the waves. But the reason why we call it the dispersion relation is because it's the consistency condition for validity of oscillations or existence of oscillations in this plasma. Okay, now, so that's our simple plasma oscillation way. And in doing this, I have kind of made it simple, uh, by which I mean I've done it in one dimension and I've tried to go through piece by piece what we're doing. It turns out when you, a lot of the bread and butter, people might say, of plasma physics uh, is calculating dispersion relations and being able to linearize and do these things, you know, and in your sleep, basically. So what I want to do is go back through this derivation and do it in quickie form, is what I would call it, but vector form, and just show you it again, uh, not in one-dimensional form, but in a little bit more, uh, you know, direct form. And, and we'll explain a little, bit, uh, a little bit more about some pieces of things by virtue of doing that. So uh, the same, we're going to do the same thing then for a while. Um, so let's call this uh, um, plasma oscillations the usual way. Derived in the normal way. Well, everybody has their own way is a little bit the problem. Um, but anyway, maybe I should say in my normal way. In any case, uh, what we have in mind uh, is well, first off, we're going to use vector notation just because it's no big deal. And I want to show you how that's no big deal. Um, the second one is, uh, but we're still, uh, we're still going to linearize. And we'll just do it a little earlier and uh, more forthrightly, let's say. And we'll still use electrostatics. That, of course, means that the electric field is derivable as minus, from a potential, minus grad phi. And, uh, but we're going to, uh, we'll add, just for purposes of keeping tra track of things, a uh, source of free charge density. And again, uh, I, I keep repeating these assumptions because after we finish doing this, we're going to uh, 
we're going to redo. We're going to, you know, then consider relaxing some of these assumptions. So the assumptions are first, of course, no magnetic field. It's always nice. Uh, simplifies things. Uh, ions are uniform. Uh, plus charge background. And they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. And that, of course, is a fairly reasonable assumption because they're so massive. So they don't respond to an electric field nearly as much as the electrons do. Then there's the fact that we have an infinite homogeneous medium. We're just, we, don't like to, we don't like to cope with additional gradient effects. Medium or plasma. Uh, and the fourth was uh, previously that the electrons move only in the x direction, but we don't need that. So I guess that's that's the limit of our assumptions that we really need here. Okay. So what do we need? What we need is our fluid equations: density conservation, momentum conservation, and Gauss's law. And so let's uh, put those down. So first, what we have is we have density conservation. Um, and that will be partial of NE with respect to T plus divergence of NE VE is equal to zero. And then we'll have momentum conservation And again, uh, we'll write out the convective derivative, M-E-N-E, -E, partial of V-E with respect to T, plus V-E dot del V-E. And that's got to be equal to the Lorentz force for the electrons, which have a negative charge. So this is minus A-E N sub E electric field. But uh, we... Uh, and, but we don't have a magnetic field, so we don't have the V cross B Lorentz force. And then we have minus gamma Te gradient N sub E. Uh, then we have Gauss's law, uh, which is just del dot uh, E is equal to rho over epsilon naught. Uh, and that's then can also be written as E over epsilon naught Ni minus Ne. And these will be the polarization densities. You know, I, I put in an electric field, it polarizes the medium, gives me a little charge density. Uh, that'll be that. And then we'll add in um, a free charge density, rho free over epsilon naught. And sort of to complete this, of course, we had that our electric field was going to be derivable uh, from a potential. E is equal to minus grand phi. Okay, so what, did, what were our steps in doing this calculation? Well, we wrote down the equations. Last time we um, did this, we stuck all the equations together, and then we tried to linearize. So we want to just more briskly do the linearization. So we'll linearize these equations by themselves. So let's uh, just linearize. And this is, again, because we're only interested uh, or most easily can calculate uh, linear perturbations uh, about an equilibrium. So what we say is that the electron density is equal to the equilibrium electron density plus a perturbation. Uh, then we have that the electric field is also some equilibrium electric field plus E tilde. Um, but we had already decided before that we weren't going to worry about that. Um, we were going to take a special case where there is no uh, electric field, partially because we've got an infinite homogeneous medium. We might as well do that. We don't need to have a uniform acceleration in one particular direction. Um, and then the flow velocity, VE, was also its equilibrium flow velocity plus its perturbation. But again, we said we'll consider a non-drifting equilibrium, so we don't have that. 
So if I put this in then to the density conservation equation, what I find is I get partial with respect to T of N naught E plus N E tilde. And then this is plus uh, divergence of N naught E plus N E tilde. And then but only V E tilde. And that's equal to zero. Now a little uh, linearization here. First, uh, N naught E is supposed to be an equilibrium homogeneous constant. So this operating on that is zero. Um, like what, well, this on this is second order, so that's nonlinear, and so we'll neglect that. And uh, this, again, the density is supposed to be infinite homogeneous medium, so this can be brought outside. So what this uh, readily gives us, ignoring the nonlinearities and taking account of the constancy of the density in equilibrium, is this gives us dNe tilde by dt plus n naught e uh, divergence of v e tilde, which says, by the way, physically, that the only way we can get density perturbations is by having some compressibility, divergence v not equal to zero, in the plasma. And how are we going to do that? Do something with the momentum balance, right? So we've got to go to our momentum balance, and we write it out now as Me Ne becomes N naught E plus N E tilde. And then there's the flow velocity derivatives, first the partial derivative, but I've only got now the fluctuating electric, uh, the fluctuating flow velocity. I don't have any equilibrium. So I've got dVe dt plus VE tilde dot del VE tilde. Um, and then this has got to be equal to uh, minus E N naught E plus N E tilde, electric field tilde only, and minus gamma TE uh, gradient N naught E plus N E tilde. Okay, now we uh, do our usual surgery on this equation, get rid of as much as we can, but keep what we, all the linear terms. So the first thing we observe is this times this is a nonlinear term. So we neglect that term entirely. It's nice. Uh, this times this would be a nonlinear term. So we neglect that term. And so the only thing we're left with is m n naught e dve tilde by dt, the time derivative of the flow velocity. Uh, here's another nonlinear term, so we neglect that. And the gradient operating on this is zero. Uh, you know, it's a uniform homogeneous density, no gradient in it. So if we can extract from that what we've got left, what we have left is then Me and naught E dVe tilde by dt, and it's still in vector form here, is minus E and naught E electric field minus gamma Te gradient of Ne tilde. And so this became the equation. the momentum balance equation, sorry. Or actually what we sometimes would call the perturbed momentum balance equation. By the way, you notice how I stuck that tilde in there real quick? Sort of a quick check you always do when you're doing linearization is if you've, you've got to make sure you've got one tilde in each quantity, okay? And if you don't, you either didn't label it right or you didn't get it right, okay? You're, you're not doing quite the right stuff. Um, Okay, now our final equation um, was the uh, Gauss's law, which is divergence of E tilde. There's only an electric field in the oscillating state or perturbed. Is equal to the charge density, E over epsilon naught, uh, times the 
ion density when we didn't have it, we didn't allow ourselves any ion density perturbation. We only allowed ourselves a, an ion density in equilibrium, so there's no n i tilde. But then there's a minus n naught e and a minus n e tilde. And then we'll say that there was no, fr no free charges in equilibrium, so we only had them in the, in the uh, perturbed state. Any simplification possible in this equation? Well, quasi-neutrality says that I better have, I, I, um, well, I'd better not have any net charge between electrons and ions. I'm supposed to have an equal number in equilibrium or on average. So with this in mind, then my um, Gauss's law becomes the divergence of uh, E tilde is then just minus E over epsilon naught and E tilde plus rho free tilde over epsilon naught. So this is then my perturbed Gauss's law. Perturbed density conservation equation, perturbed momentum conservation equation, perturbed Gauss's law. What's the next step? We linearize. Next step is we want to assume that we have wave-like solutions. Stick that in. Right? So let's do that without combining the equations. So maybe I should say posit wave-like solutions or propose. Um, okay, so what do we do? Well, we say that Ne tilde of x and t Remember, my density has a spatial dependence and a time dependence. That uh, is going to be equal to some coefficient, which is perhaps a functional of k and omega, but then times e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Now, we went through this before, but let's do it just a little bit again. Dn, e dn tilde by dt. Um, well, I stick that in, and the only thing it operates is e to the i minus i omega t, so we get minus i omega n hat of k and omega e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. So this is just equal to minus i omega n tilde. So indeed, we've got just like we had before. What about the gradient of n tilde? Well... I've got to take the gradient of e to the i k dot x. Okay. So how does that work out? Well, let's we got to, maybe we ought to write out and say Cartesian coordinates. We could choose any coordinate system, but for this operation, what that would be is x hat partial with respect to x plus y hat partial with respect to y plus z hat partial with respect to z. So there I wrote out gradient. And then for my n tilde, of course, I've got my n hat of k and omega. Now, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Well, that's e to the i k x x plus k y y plus, run out of room, k z z minus omega t, all inside the parentheses. So, now, we look at this then. Uh, d by dx operating on e to the i kx will just give me uh, i k sub x times x will just give me i k sub x. On the d by dy, that one will give me i k y. Likewise, the d by dz will give me i k z. So what we find out of this is that we have i times x hat kx plus y hat ky, plus z hat kz, and then we'll have n hat k and omega, and I'll write this back as e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And this last thing is just our total n tilde, and what's that? That's just our total k 
k vector broken down into components. So this becomes grad n just goes to i k grad n tilde goes to i k vector n tilde. So what we see out of this is generically, whenever you have a partial with respect to t, it goes to minus i omega on any quantity oscillating like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, whereas any d by dx, which is equal to the gradient of some, again, fluctuating quantity, it goes to i k vector. Yes, question? When, when you take your gradient, don't you have to take it on the k omega plot there? Um, well, no, I don't have to take it on the k omega because my k is a constant. So the gradient says what varies in space. And so by presumption, I had an infinite homogeneous medium, so I can do this. My k is actually constant at all positions in space. I'm looking for a wave, uh, an oscillating wave with one particular k throughout all of space. I couldn't get by with this if I was doing an inhomogeneous plasma. I then have to take account of that. But for this purpose, I don't need that. So I can just consider, some people write this, uh, perhaps it's a good point to mention, some people write this as not n hat of, say, k n omega, but they write it n hat subscripted k omega, which sort of tells you, you know, it's evaluated for that particular k n omega, or it's a kind of just an index. It's not really a functional dependence sometimes in, in an infinite homogeneous plasma. Okay, so now let's go back and use these handy-dandy rules. Um, and these really are pretty handy-dandy rules, by the way. You really want to get in the habit of using these because they really simplify things. Uh, every time you see partial respect to t minus i omega, d by dx, gradient goes to i k. So if we uh, stick those in, then um, what are, well, we have to stick them into these equations. Um, Well, that will, let's just say that will be our next step. And so I'll, I'll, I'll quit here as a break because uh, I'll, uh, if I start putting them in, I'll get about halfway through one slide and that just won't work. <laughs> so. so we'll have a